You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Faith, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney. Snarky Faith is radio for the spiritually disenfranchised. And if you've had enough of the insanity in Christianity, you have come to the right place. Here at Snarky Faith, we're all about finding a safe, sane faith grounded in reality and working to make the world a better place in tangible ways. This is not a zone for spiritual escapism, Sunday school answers, or Christianese. We're all here to call out religious BS and look for better ways forward. If you can handle your conversations about faith with copious amounts of... Sarcasm. And also a little bit of this... Then you've come to the right place. Welcome home. On today's show, we're going to be talking with the director of the new film... 1949. We're going to be talking with Rocky Rogio on our show. But before we descend into the snark, we've got a few quick bits of housekeeping. This broadcast and all past podcasts can be found at www.snarkyfaith.com and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube. We're there. We're everywhere. Just look for Snarky Faith. And if you like the show, make sure to subscribe. And if you're feeling particularly generous, drop a review over on Apple Podcasts. It helps get the word out to new listeners, and I'd personally appreciate it. And if you want to interact more with the show, you can find Snarky Faith, the Snarky Faith page on Facebook. You can drop me a line at questions at snarkyfaith.com, and there's even a snarky hotline if you want to leave a message. That'll probably end up on the air. The number is 919-525-1570. That's 919-525-1570. All right, let's go ahead and hop in here with the show. How's everyone doing this week? How are you? We kind of are just coming off of of the weekend of love, of Valentine's Day. Did you survive it? Did you do well? Did you figure out how to show love to another person? That's kind of, if you didn't, dang it. We've done no good on this show, teaching people how to love others and things of that nature. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting week uh, of sorts because we had Valentine's Day. We also had uh, impeachment dose ending unceremoniously quickly on Saturday. So that was kind of a weird taste in the mouth going through the weekend, kind of just watching us go, oh, oh, a rich, a rich white guy. No accountability. It checks out. It's America. That kind of makes sense. That totally makes sense. So yeah, so that's, yeah, there's, you know, a little bit of a weird taste entering this week. But what I want to do is I actually want to, I'm going to begin our show with with two separate stories that will hopefully kind of lay into what we're going to talk about today. And and I feel like we need a little bit of, of good news. I mean, good news being that, hey, we don't have to talk about Trump anymore. Uh, or at least for a long time. That's also good news. But this, and and I'm not going to say this is my idea. No, but it is, not really. One of these things I feel like I've had on the show and, and, and just in years past, I've, I've always come back to this idea that I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish Christian art was honest. Uh, especially like in regards to things like music and films, which we know so often are both rubbish. They're both just totally trash because what we've, what we've seen, especially in, in Christian art over the past ah, 50, 60 years, it's created its own niche of an area and it's kind of created its own rules and it's not always that good because it's operating on a playing field that's not so level and, and things like artistry get lost by the wayside. Because what we've done as Christians is our art must preach as much as we preach on a regular basis, which really makes crappy art, or really you could call it propaganda. So yes, the Christian film industry, the Christian music industry has done great with propaganda for a long while, but (laughs) honesty, no, no. We've talked about this on the show that I believe a lot of films, if they want to really depict what (laughs) 
<laughs> if they want to depict life in a real way, most Christian films should be rated R because life inherently is rated R. And, and dealing with the Bible, which is also very rated R as well, too. I guess what I'm getting at is that I wish that Christian art was honest. But I also wish that Christians were honest. And I also wish the church was honest. So I can kind of see why this industry has become very dishonest because they know how to play to their base and get paid. But you know what? Here's an interesting story. It's a, it's a fantastic story. And this is coming from Religion News Services. Um, is, and the article is entitled this uh, by Emily McFarlane Miller. LGBTQ singer-songwriter Game Stops Christian Music with number one Christian album on iTunes. And the article begins by this, and, and it goes like this. For the second straight day, and this is coming from last week when they were talking about this, an openly queer Christian artist has the top Christian album on iTunes, Preacher's Kid by Selmer. Uh, the artist, uh, whose name is Grace Baldridge, hit number one on Tuesday, last week, on Apple's iTunes store. And I heard this happen. I downloaded the album. And I will say in many ways, one, I don't know if this album's for everybody, but for me, I loved it. I loved how raw and honestly she wrestles through her sexuality and her faith and the areas where her faith has let her down and where the faith community has let her down in ways that make her question doubt God. Now, I know this isn't something that's going to pop up. Uh, <laughs> On, on Sunday mornings during worship service, but I loved the raw honesty, the questions, the wrestling, the, the hope, the bitterness that, that is all wrapped into her album, Preacher's Kid. And I wish we had more worship albums like this. An honest faith preaches honestly. And it's able to reach people in a way that they fake, holy, pious, everything's good, Jesus is my boyfriend kind of faith and, and art just, just comes up hollow to people that are watching from the outside. So if I'm getting her name, if I'm getting her artist name right, uh, similar, excellent work. I love it. If you guys are interested, you should check it out because it's still in the top over on iTunes. And secondly, something that was kind of impacting my mind that's feeding into my brain space uh, currently um, also happened last week. And if, if you listen to last week's show, I, I've been digging into Julian of Norwich. And I had recently stumbled across a passage of hers like talking about the soul that I, it's been entertaining and just interesting in my mind. I'm not really sure where it's going in my head, but I find it fascinating. And, she, and, and Julian says this, um, I saw the soul so large as if it were an endless world and a joyful kingdom. And I understood that it is a beautiful city. And I loved this idea of, of thinking about our soul being large and, and, and vast, um, often something that we think is very small. And insignificant, something that we don't think about all the time in that way. But but Norwich bringing out this idea that it's this, it's this restful place. It's this place where 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 Jesus resides, and and as she had put it, it is it is like a familiar home and an endless dwelling. And and I was wrestling through this idea of 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 the idea of the smallness um, being able to incorporate like a city, and being able to kind of think of uh, what what does it look like in our cities. You know, what, what are the vibe? What is the heart? What is the, the soul of our cities? And I started doing just kind of some, a little bit of a research back into, especially into her time and what, what she was really trying to get at. And during like the Middle Ages, the, the, this concept of soul and city oftentimes were, were intertwined and, and were considered not necessarily synonymous with each other, but there was a lot of overlap because there was such an intersection of, this intersectionality of, of pathways um, and, and, and life and energy. And, and I love being able to compare a city and the heart and vibrancy of a city to the heart and vibrancy of someone's soul. But in, in, in very much the same way, we can also, if you've ever been to cities that are broken down and are old and have been forgotten, it also could feel like someone's soul that's much in that place as well. 
I mean, if, if you have those out there that, that study uh, Eastern religions, even, even the word chakra also speaks to that idea of intersectional, uh, intersectionality, this thing where many things are kind of coming together. And, and I love this kind of large and small view of the world that, 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 that Norwich is getting at here. And so as I was trying to study this, I was, I was trying to look up uh, just like word studies between soul and city and trying to figure out where really what, what, what she was after here. And what was fascinating is I stumbled onto a literal city referred to as Seoul City. Now, I don't mean S-E-O-U-L city, like in Korea. I mean Seoul City, S-O-U-L city, North Carolina. What I found, what, what I found interesting um, about that, and even, even connecting this to the music by uh, Similar, this city, uh, Seoul City, and I'll tell you a little bit of history of it, was, was founded on this idea of inclusion. And inclusion is going to be a big part of what we're talking about here on our show. And this city, I'll give you a bit of a history of this. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a sad tragedy of a story. So in, in the late 60s, Seoul City was a proposed development that they were going to build in northeast uh, North Carolina, near the border of Virginia. They had allotted 5,000 acres to be able to erect a, a multiracial community that focused on helping minorities, helping the poor, educating people. Uh, they, were, they were organized to be a self-sustaining uh, city that, that had jobs, that had medical, uh, that had, yes, they, they had all the infrastructure planned for this. They even, they even were funded uh, by the federal government in 1972. Um, mm -hmm. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development allotted them money. They bought the land for this. And, and for a moment in history, it was, it was a beautiful idea. Now, most things, especially in the South, that we know, inevitably get ruined. And this, this dream of something new, this dream that, that had already started an infrastructure of building houses and buildings there, this dream was killed. It was slowed down and eventually killed by famous senatorial bigot and segregationist Jesse Helms. And, and this, this city that was an idea and a city of promise that allowed people to have a seat at the table eventually sputtered out and died. And I, I was fascinated with this idea when I was trying to read the history behind it. So my, my oldest daughter, Ada, is still finishing up uh, getting enough uh, hours for her driver's license. So I decided, hey, this is only like an hour and a half away. You need more hours on your driver's license. And I have some time. So let's go have daddy-daughter time and have a small road trip. Um, and so we drove out. And we investigated the city that, that's off a highway. It's, it's, it's just miles off a highway. It's, it's a forgotten place. And it's, it's frankly very eerie and sad there. You get there, there's a large sign for Seoul City that's kind of old and dilapidated. There's, there's buildings that are falling apart. And there, and there are houses where people still live there. But it's also a place that the kind of time is forgot. Like the closest gas station is probably 20 minutes away. And... And even when we got out to like look around and kind of look at some of these old buildings, uh, my daughter just told me, she's like, this is so weird. She's like, this is, she's like, is this what it feels like to be in a horror movie? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? She's like, it's so eerily quiet. And it was one of those places where you could even see, you could see areas where they had cleared out trees that are just kind of now open, where, where, where houses uh, from a certain time period were built. You see all of this there. And, and it was sad. It's sad to see a place that had so much hope and promise that was ruined because someone didn't want people having a seat at the table. And a lot of the idea that we're going to be getting behind here on our show that we're talking through with, this, with our interview um, is talking about this, this idea of equality. Well, actually, more the opposite of that. <laughs> we're going to be talking about the price of exclusion. And what often happens when we begin to see our faith as a type of a country club where we 
want people that make us feel comfortable, that look like us, that, that speak like us, that think like us. And that's what we want our faith community to look like. That's what we're going to get. We're going to get exclusionary tactics that push people out. When, if we look back to the ways and teachings of Jesus, Jesus continues to say, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 uh, no. My father's kingdom is very big. It's very wide. And it has plenty of room for all of you. And the problem, I'll say this, the problem is that it, it robs us of the richness of a diverse community. And having a diverse community, what it does is it gives us a richness of perspectives, a richness of giftings, and, and a richness of readings of things down to scripture. We're able to wrestle well together in community. Now, if we try to get tribal and silo ourselves to just be around the people that are like us, it's going to rob us of the diverseness of community. Case in point, case in point, we're going to hop in to the segment that we do here every week. It's the Christian crazy, where we highlight the choicest cuts of the Christian nuts in America today. And I do this not just because it's fun to mock them, because, oh, it is fun. But I also do this as education for us to be able to point out this is not Christianity. This, this is some sort of weird, bizarro world of white people with really weird haircuts and cameras uh, that say crazy nonsense and people give them money to do it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. No, no, no. No amens for that. None. But we do this to be able to point out that, hey, think of this. If any of these, as you listen to these crazy idiots, if any of these idiots lived in community well with others, would they be coming up with this insane crap? My answer is I don't think they would. I think someone would tell them that's nuts. But no one did. So it's my job. So onward and upward to the Christian crazy of the week. Claude Hammers, the Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. <laughs> So we're going to be running through the Christian crazy pretty fast, so buckle up. First one, first bit of the crazy, case in point. Let's talk about vaccines. Hmm, anyone have opinions on vaccines? Anyone? Prophet Mark Taylor? Tell us about what you think about vaccines and probably why this is not going to end well. It's not going to end well. We all know not to take the vaccines, right? right. Experimental, don't take it. It's a bioweapon. Exactly. Don't even take the test at this point. Yes. I just, I've read two different articles now, saw a video where the vaccine is now in the test. Wow. No, it's not. That's a lie. It releases these little star things into your intestines because of the, the that test, and then it goes into your brain. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, uh, look, uh, yeah, I just really don't know what I'm talking about. I'm pulling this out. My rectum is really what that translates to being. Yeah. Yeah, I like my doctors and experts to say there's little star things that do things. <laughs> now, we can laugh at this idiot, but you know what? I'm going to give you a story from The Guardian. And this story was about, hmm, a problem they're finding with COVID in Brazil. And I'll just go ahead and quote this directly from the article. Tribal leaders in the Amazon uh, blame Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, a.k.a. kind of like Brazilian Trump. Yeah, he's that good. Um, Bolsonaro and some of his avid supporters in the evangelical community for, sto for stoking skepticism about coronavirus vaccines, despite a national death toll that lags only behind the United States. Religious fundamentals and evangelical missionaries are preaching against the vaccine to tribal leaders in the Amazon who are dying. Their tribes are dying. Now, in the U.S., we just call these people idiots. Uh, but really, the information they're passing around is, is murderous. They are allowing people to die because of their lies. Yeah. And they're doing that in the name of Jesus. Praise no one. Because that's disgusting. Now, we've been kind of in this post-Trump moving towards Biden administration kind of period in American history right now. We're kind of in that little tweener zone where you've got most of the country kind of going like, all right, Biden's our president, but there's a bit of holdouts. There's a bit of holdouts. 
And who, 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 who is stoking the flames of their insanity? <laughs> I mean, there's the QAnon people, but there's also the prophets. Yes, the prophets, the so-called prophets of God that are on TV raking in dough and making people scared and telling people a bunch of crazy crap. Don't believe me? Well, we've been making fun of the prophets on the show because the prophets have been pretty wrong. But now Hank Kuhneman is going to tell us why we're wrong. And we're wrong because we're just not reading the rules right. The prophet book. The prophet handbook of profiting rules and how to make profits or something like that. In the New Testament, the way that prophets were to be judged, according to 1 Corinthians, you read it. It says that if, you, if, if one prophesies, let it be by two, if not but by three. And then it says you may all prophesy, speaking even of the prophets, but it says let the others judge. Well, who are the others? The other prophets. So only other prophets can profit shame. Their only other prophets are the ones that can call you to the mat on your insanity. Dang it. I let my profiting credentialing lapse. Now I really can't do this anymore. The show's over, folks. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I can't do it anymore. Sorry. Sorry. Hank's right. I, I don't, I don't, no, I don't really care about this. What? So only prophets can judge prophets? Hmm. So let me look myself. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in tongues of men or angels but have no love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and, I have, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but I do not have love, I am nothing. Oh, okay. So like, you're just kind of confirming that you're nothing. Okay, cool. Checks out with me. In our last bit of the crazy prophets out there within Christianity, let's kind of file this one under the that's not how this works with Cat Care. Because most of the time when Cat Care opens her mouth and speaks about God or spirituality or heaven or most anything, you can kind of just fit that in. Hey, Cat, that's not how it works. So see how long you can last into her drivel before you say, wait, that's not how it works. It's not long, but this is fascinating. Now, when worship happens uh, on the earth normally, it, it is collected, number one, by angels a lot of times, but it also goes up through the atmosphere and it's put into the bowls before the altar of God and it creates an incense. Well, that sacrifice of praise is the most beautiful incense in the throne room when someone's doing that but it also creates a weapon. As you do that, when you say that, you know, I, I, you're worthy anyway, you know, you are my God and I will not serve another, you are it. Missiles come out of your mouth and they go up through the second heaven where Satan has his little mock kingdom set up and you actually blow up parts of it. I mean, really, it explodes. They have to try to rebuild all the time. Really? And so you're very dangerous against hell. In your worst days, we should always worship God, especially I on mean, this literally, this has never been taught, <laughs> taught to me. <laughs> that guy speaking at the end, uh, if you don't know, that is Steve Schultz. He is a, I don't know, he's behind the Elijah list. I feel like he's just really a sentient egg, a sentient hard-boiled egg. You look at him, it makes sense. So that sentient hard-boiled egg is fascinated over this new thing that he's never understood that when we pray missiles, what? What? Like, I, I was thinking about stopping it during any moment in it, but she was going, man, Cat Care was like in that rat a tat 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 That was, that was... That was crazy. That was like a machine gun crazy. It was just so much packed in so much nonsense. And it, it blows my mind how far people are willing to go logically, mentally, uh, faith-wise, spiritually, and just intellectually, intellectually with believing this kind of horseshit. My apologies to horses and their shit. I'm pretty sure folks like this are who Jesus was referring to in, in Matthew 18, when he says, if any, uh, if, but if anyone causes these little ones who believe in me to stumble, 
it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for the causes of sin. These stumbling blocks must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. And to quote Keanu, quoting Jesus, woe. You see, I'm tired of misinformation. When I read articles that tell me that, that, uh, that a quarter of all conservative evangelicals believe in QAnon, what? Like, what have we done in the church? We have taught Christians to be idiots. That's the only thing I can surmise from all of this is, is that over the years, I, I've spent most of my years either as a kid growing up in church or working for a church, and, and all I can see is that somehow American Christianity has taught people to be absolute abject morons. Morons, because they either believe QAnon or they believe a lot of these folks in the Christian crazy. It blows my mind how somehow, 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 a movement of faith that was started by Jesus Christ, that was that is modeled after his teachings and his ways and the way that he, he lived his life, um, that we are able to get to this nuts with that. A, a faith that should, be, that should be like drenched in helping others, in being inclusive, in saying, oh, oh come, 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 come. There's more room at my table. There's, there's more room in my house. There's, come on, come on, come on. We should be the most inclusive motherfuckers on the block. I'm sorry. We should. We absolutely should. But are we? Or are we the most exclusive motherfuckers on the block? Which one is it? Inclusive or exclusive? What is Christianity known for these days? Huh? Yeah. Rhetorical question if you're really trying to answer. I mean, good God, as Christians, if Christians... We should be known as being the most graceful, loving, compassionate uh, <laughs> servants in our communities. That's what it's supposed to look like. And I know it doesn't. I know it doesn't. Which brings us to a fantastic conversation about an intriguing new documentary that is being finished right now. That we're going to be sitting down uh, with Rocky Roggio from the 1946 documentary. And why 1946? Well, just a bit of a preview. The first time the word homosexual appeared in any Bible was in the Revised Standard Version, which was published in February 11th of 1946. And the RSV's translation of 1 Corinthians 6-9 was incorrect. And we're going to talk about how one big oops for the church led to people doubling down, getting hateful, and acting not anything like Jesus, and turned Christianity into being a huge stumbling block for a group of our population, and turned another group of our population into hateful bigots. Because they said, God told me I could, because God likes it when I hate. So here we go with our interview. All right, today I'm sitting down with Rocky Roggio. She's the independent filmmaker and director behind the upcoming film, 1946. 1946 is a revolutionary new film that chronicles how the misuse of a single word changed the course of modern history. So thank you for joining us today, Rocky. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Now, now I want to know this. Now, first of all, give us a little synopsis about what 1946 is about. Sure, 1946 is about a mistranslation in the Bible. As we know, the Bible has been translated into multiple languages all around the world. And so we delve into a little bit of the history of translation, but specifically this mistranslation, and then what happened beyond this mistranslation and how it went from one verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 mm -hmm. to subsequently nine different verses as we see in present today. Mm -hmm. um, most Bibles use six verses are the main, what we call clobber passages, which are used to then clobber or used as a weapon against the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. So we trace the history of this mistranslation and then anti-gay theology created 
in specifically America, and then the church's response to what they call the culture wars, and how the church has then turned this, what they consider the culture wars, into um, they have to always change their curriculum in the church when they talk about sex, you know, and so we kind of trace that evolution as well. And what that does is it shows the church doubling down on yet another group of minorities. Mm -hmm. And we can trace how this word ended up. And what it does is it condemns a group of people versus an act that Mm -hmm. has a victim. That's an obvious victim. So the verses are very easily debunked. Uh, And we're going to kind of stay true to that theme. Outside of that theme, we're going to look at the two researchers who were compelled enough to really ask this question. How did this happen? When did this happen? What were they thinking? If this was in 46, the translation team was um, commissioned in the early 30s. Mm. So what were these men? They were all white men, of course, on a committee who arranged the New King James Version into the first modern English Bible. What were they possibly thinking? And what could they possibly have known about a homosexual? And so two researchers were cared enough to ask that question. They went to Yale University, discovered the archives of this translation, have done the work. So we look into their story, how they got to this, you know, this question. Uh, And then we also look at gay Christians Hmm. and we examine Christians who you know, are not afraid to say we do exist and this is okay. And then they also share some of their trials and tribulations growing up LGBTQ in the church, having bad theology thrown at them, used against them, and again, weaponized, having the Bible being used as a weapon against them. So that's kind of a little bit it. Um, Beyond that, you know, we do, we're learning so much about other mistranslations that have had a great impact on our society. So outside of the movie, we're trying to show some of that stuff on other platforms. Like we just launched a TikTok, which is going super viral right now. And we really want to work with other voices that are taking a stance against bad theology that is harmful to our people. Mm-hmm. You know, so I guess that's kind of my lesson in uh, me as the director, my discovery through this one mistranslation that's fascinating, that has impacted just a, a wonderful group of people, really, the LGBTQ community that is now excluded from the church. And it's, it is fascinating when you begin to like un, unravel this mess that happened like at a, at a certain point um, and, and the damage that it has done. And, and even talking about with bad theology, um, this goes beyond the fact because then you have pastors that just get taught with a Bible that's been translated, and you don't often even dig into, well, why was that there? No, you're translating. A hundred percent. It just was there. And You'll go through like theological school, and nobody knows about this. Yep. You know, and so even our lead researcher is like, I graduated from, you know, Talibut University. We didn't mm-hmm. talk about this. Nobody, 1946, what is this, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit of that, too. Some of it is completely um, cover up by the church. And some of it, some of it's malice, some of it is completely accidental or forgivable, which the 1946, we can show that there was no malice. It was a complete mistake in the 30s and 40s. A homosexual was considered a pedophile. It was a homosexual vice. It was an act against another. And it usually was a man abusing a young boy. And they had no other word for it. We were just understanding these new um scientific terms, they're scientific terms, homosexuality, heterosexuality. And so we finally have these scientific understandings, but our understanding of that with our, within our language didn't catch up to what really a homosexual is, which mm-hmm. is someone with an orientation, not somebody who commits an egregious act on someone. But that's what these translators really believed it was. You know, so it was easy for them to, you know, to do that. And so we'll get into, we found letters with them describing why they made this decision. It's fascinating. It's really, really, it it really, it really is about how you dug into all this. Now, now what, what led you to this project? Like as a filmmaker, why this film? Like why now? Yeah. So I was living in Los Angeles. I just moved back to the East coast where my parents live and for some other reasons, but um, this was 2000, I guess, 17. I started going back to church. I was dating a woman who was like, I'm a Christian. We're going to church. And I was like, what? I was like, you're a Christian, you know? And so uh, in order to please the relationship, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to church on Sunday. 
And I found myself in a church that wanted to recognize everyone with radical love. You know, that's the whole like, we're a church for people that believes that church is irrelevant, you know? And I was like, what is this nonsense? And uh, it's a little baby hill song, the lights and the smoke and the charismatic white pastor, you know? Um, but you're, we're in Los Angeles and, you know, you would think that the LGBTQ community is accepted in a different way. And so when you peel back the layers, I started really peeling back the layers, being back in the church after 20 years saying, wait a minute, like I might be able to hold my girlfriend's hand and the pastor's going to say, Hey, come to our church picnic, but they're never going to marry us. Mm -hmm. So I started getting vocal and I started asking questions and I started saying, well, I, I can't leave this Bible study that I'm in right now with, with y'all. Right. And, you know, the two leaders of the Bible study are like, what do you mean? And I'm like, get out of here. You totally know what I'm talking about. Don't even downplay it because that's even worse. And then I ended up getting the bylaws because that's what you do. You know, mm -hmm. so not only am I a, a director, producer, I'm Italiano, Mafiano. So I know how to like get in there and get the dirt, you know. So I had an intern that was 20 years old that worked in the nursery that was just getting, um, you know, she, she was getting staffed with the church. So she was in our office one day. And of course, like we're in Beverly Hills on this penthouse. I, I had this like crazy job where, you know, I needed some interns. And so she's a young actress and she sees like all these people coming in and out of the penthouse. And I was like, oh, you got something from the church. Can I see it? And she sent it to me. And in the email, it surely said, don't send this outside of anybody in leadership. Don't send this outside of anybody in staff signed by the pastor. And sure enough, in that letter from the pastor, you know, they use three Bible verses that condemn the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. And so I personally then experienced a church that I felt was lying to me mm -hmm. and they're lying to their community. If you feel that we're not, you know, the separate, but equal, or we're not equal, you know, in your space, y'all need to put it on your bylaws. Mm -hmm. Y'all need to put it on your website, you know, so anyway, I started getting vocal, which led me to getting really ticked off, which led me to learning about gay Christians. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, gay Christian. Now, you know, first of all, like dating one was just like, no. And so I, I literally Googled gay Christian and I was like, oh my God, there's a whole world of gay Christians out there. I was like blown away. I found out about the gay Christian network, which is now queer Christian fellowship, Matthew Vines organization, the reformation project. And I was like, I just didn't even know what to do, right? So I then found an affirming space. And within a week, they had a class. I mean, just randomly, this class going on on homosexuality in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And in that class, I learned of the two Greek words, Malakoi and Arsinokoitai. In that class, I also learned of Kathy Boldock, who's one of our lead researchers. And she is one of the main stories in our film. Uh, and she was preaching a sermon. You know, she was doing a, a seminar. She does these long sex seminars around the Bible and 2000 year history of the Bible and contextualization of these verses and other historical delves. And so, and my parents were coming into town and my parents are super conservative, definitely non-affirming. So I was like, let's film and put everybody in a room together and see what happens. And on a whim, that's literally what happened. Um, as I was on this exploration to just kind of call bullshit, basically. Uh, and I put everybody in a room and as you can imagine, sitting next to your mother and father for six hours and hearing Kathy Baldock say penetration, procreation, <laughs> and patriarchy more times than you want, you know, while you're filming it is amazing. So anyway, we, we have footage of my dad then saying he was so furious and then they, they all debate each other. And now a year later, we took my father to the Reformation Project where he got mm -hmm. to see the characters again and then he meet more of the voices in this space as I'm learning about gay Christians. So anyway, all that's in the film as well too, but that's kind of how it happened. It, it was accidental, you know, and I'm a filmmaker, you pick up a camera, you just start shooting. No, that's an amazing way that it all just kind of fell into place right off. I mean, just from, yeah, it, this is definitely, a, so is, is, are you walking alongside in this journey? I mean, you're the filmmaker, but are you the voice also that, that is that is? Yeah, that's a really good this. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I accidentally have now become part of that voice, yes. Mm -hmm. Because so while we were sitting in that conference filming, and I was already on this other exploration of a mistranslation in Luke, which is super fascinating about two men in a bed, mm -hmm. which is a whole nother story. And so that's kind of why I already was, you know, starting to film. But when we were in this conference, that's, 
before getting permission to film at the church and from Kathy and my parents, I binge watched Kathy. So I was familiar with her work and really interested, but I had no idea what they were working on mm. with this RSV translation history. And then looking at all of the other American translation teams, they went to all the archives. They went all over the US to different archives to look into why the translation teams put the word homosexual in different verses. What were they thinking? So that started in 46, you know, and then they tell us in this conference, they found this man who wrote a letter that challenged the translation team. And the letter is, I mean, it'll blow your mind how well written this letter is. And he's alive and he was a pastor. He was a closeted gay man for 60 years. I was like, this is a story. So I just really, I pretty much have quit and dedicated everything and anything that I can to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And part of the story is the fact that the reason you, you incorporated your father. Now, you and I were talking earlier. Uh, now, you were raised. What was your father's job? You haven't said this in the interview so far. Oh, yeah. shoot. Yeah. So my dad's a non-denominational minister. <laughs> yes. So you were raised under this. Um, so you also have, this has been probably a, a huge part of your journey from being probably squished down or feeling as if you had been you were a second class citizen pushed out for, as a child. I mean, so this is, this is very, does it feel full circle in many ways for a lot yeah, of- Yeah, and that's kind of how I felt when I was in that conference, having the verses, having these verses be used against you. Growing up LGBTQ as a pastor's kid, not really even knowing what that was until you really understood what this really is that's going on. Um, you know, it's, it's quite difficult and- we struggled with it for a long time. Uh, and when I say we struggled with it, I mean, I know, I knew who I was and I know who I am. You know, it just, we had to wrestle with what my parents thought the Bible said. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I really want to get across in the film too, is that the vic there are victims on both sides because they legitimately believed their beliefs have shifted a little, but they believe that homosexuals go to hell. And so they took this first Corinthians, which is the verse that is the thesis, the main point of the film um, that then led to all the other verses using homosexual, uh, you know, used against me in that way where they really thought I was going to go to hell and they had to wrestle with that. You know, they had to come to terms with, oh, wait a minute. Well, so my, my real name's Sharon, which is a whole other thing. So mom and dad call me Sharon. And, you know, well, Sharon was baptized. And I believe that she really legitimately, you know, like they had to, these are the conversations they're having in their head. Like, is she really a Christian? Is she going to go to heaven? Mm -hmm. So our oppressors need to be rescued from this bad theology too. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. No, I, th I think it is. And I think when you begin to hopefully destigmatize a lot of these things, it, it tends to take the pressure, at least the hope is, that it tends to take kind of the pressure out of the room, especially even how you hold scripture. Because I think for so long, it's it's been something that that people have used as a weapon um, against just entire groups of people. And or they've used this as, as a weapon to be able to oppress, to be able to beat down people, to be able to repress themselves in many ways, <laughs> is what also happens to people. Yep. And I 100%. think to be able to take that out, it, it just, it, it hopefully leads to a lot more freedom. Um, that's the goal. And I yeah. hope we can take the, you know, take that out. Um, it's going to be hard for people to cross that line. It's going to sure. be hard for people to, you know, take that step, mm -hmm. but with a little bit of grace and hopefully with the tone of our film, like our film is very much, we're not right. You're not wrong. It's not an us versus them. We're, you know, this is a theological academic relational approach to a, a literal mistranslation. Mm -hmm. And we have the notes we have the documents we have the translation history to show this mm -hmm. so you know you can dispute it all you want but uh, what do you, what do you do with this so yes. can you just come and meet us at least halfway let's talk about this so hopefully people can take a step back from their own privi privileged reality to mm -hmm. say we need to really look at this mm -hmm. because it does hurt people it's it kills does. people you know what are, what are we doing when you're telling people that who you are is fundamentally wrong mm -hmm. and what kind of god is that who says you know you have to change like this god this god of the conservatives that's so angry if god is all loving like why is he killing billions of people and sending everybody to hell yeah that just doesn't make sense no it that's doesn't that's a whole you're, other story no we but but you're right i mean but you're right <laughs> i mean if, if if christians want to be able to to pursue this thrust that god is a god of love then you can't say, but, 
yeah. in, in, in those kind of situations. And I feel like there's always a but. And for a long yeah. time, for a lot of conservatives, there's yes, but. And exactly. Then, nobody wants, nobody needs that but. Nobody you know? does. No. We, all, we all have one but. We don't need two buts. Like, <laughs> That's true. Keep your butt out of my business, you know, but. But seriously, you know, uh, it's it's just um, I don't even know where to go with all that. It, but how do we get people to really, really listen? Yeah. You know. Now, are you are you hope? Do you see this film as a tool for dialogue and a tool to be able to bridge and and bridge Absolutely. divides? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we're trying to set it up that way. Like, definitely, we want it to be entertaining. We want it to be educational. Mm -hmm. We want it to be heart warming you know these are real stories um but it's also real history um but we do want it to be seen all over the world translated in multiple languages mm -hmm. so it can be used as a tool we actually are starting and working on an ambassador program or grassroots program which we're kind of testing the waters on what that looks like but we mm -hmm. get approached by people from all over the world a woman in nigeria recently it was like wow people in nigeria need to hear this because mm -hmm it's, it's such a Christian nation and the people will die and the, the community will be like, Oh, well, they were a homosexual who cares, yeah. Yeah. you know? And so that's unacceptable. Uh, and we're listening to that and we want to respond to that. So what we're hoping to do with these people who are contacting us and those who are connecting with people on social media, we're encouraging people to then go out into their communities and be brave in Nigeria, especially where this young woman is putting herself at risk by not only contacting us, doing a video meeting with us and letting us record her, you know? And so she has an alias on her social media, but she's still putting herself in danger. Mm -hmm. But these conversations are super important. So who in your community will want to come and listen and let's gather into a Zoom meeting together and share stories and really like share this research. And how do we then uh, finesse it where people will start to really pay attention and we can actually, you know, change culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I love I love the aim of it. So now now uh, uh, filmmaker Rocky. So where are we at in the process? Because I know. Good the, question. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to get to some of this. So where are we at okay. in the process? So I would say we filmed about 80 percent of the movie. Okay. We've been filming. So that conference, that first conference with my parents and Kathy and Ed, that was in October of 2018. I've been self funding and producing and filming for that first year till we finally got our first big push of funding, which landed us with Women Make Movies and a big executive producer, Daniel Carslake, who did a movie for The Bible Tells Me So. And then we went to the Reformation Project. We did another QCF uh, and we, we, we filmed all our heroes. So now we're in post-production mm -hmm. and we're looking for an editor. We are talking with a couple of people who work in long format documentary feature filmmaking, who work in more of a festival type, you know, arena and talking with a couple of people. Uh, and hopefully by the end of August, September, we have something that we can start submitting to film festivals okay. for a 2022 premiere. And then we can start showing the movie. Yeah, that's the goal. And right now, really, it's time or money. Okay. We did get a little bit of a push to be able to hire that editor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a $50,000 push. That's only going to get us six months with an editor. That's okay. not going to get us anything else like lawyer fees and licensing fees and extra clip fees and making sure we don't get sued fees, which fair use, they call it. You know, fair use attorney is a very important thing that we need mm -hmm. for documentary as much as we do have fair use out there. We need to make sure we're protecting ourselves and, and um, our partners and things like that. Um, and we're also, with that note, I mean, we're not out to um, make a propaganda film. We're out to tell the truth. And so everything that we're presenting in the movie is completely citable, factual. Everything will be able, you'll be able to look it up. We have nothing to hide. Uh, we really just, you know, as an LGBTQ person, I'm tired. Like, I'm just tired of fighting. You know what I mean? And if I can help the next generation, that's really my goal and my motivation. Mm -hmm. So. So you have, so you also have a GoFundMe um, that's available yes, thank right you now. For keeping me on track. Yeah. Sorry. I have so much because it's been like almost three years of my life now. Yeah. And there's so many different ways you can go, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a GoFundMe up that uh, will help us reach that goal yeah. by the end of this year. It, mm -hmm. I've seen it grow over the last couple of days because we're going um, viral on TikTok right now. So really, if you wanted to find out about us at mm -hmm. 1946 The Movie on mm -hmm. all of our social media platforms, you can find us on TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. 
And then 1946, the movie.com, all of our information on ways you can participate, whether you want to be a sponsor, you're an organization and you want to connect your brand with what we're doing there. There's information on the website. You can just go donate on the GoFundMe. You can buy a t-shirt for $25 and 20% will go to help us make the movie. And then the rest goes to help a small business. Uh, owner in Pennsylvania. So it's a win-win for all. There are many ways to get involved. If you can't donate, just share, follow and share and like and comment and keep telling people and keep talking about it. If you're an ally, please be vocal. Please start using your voice. We really need you. Uh, the allies are going to really make the difference in this debate. I think they will. And, I, and I'm, I'm hoping to see more of the community get around you. Um, in this moving forward, that it'll be, I think this is an important thing. It's an important correction, uh, historical yes. correction that, that I think yes. is, is long, long overdue. And I, I love hearing stories where you happen to be in the right place at the right time, oh meeting gosh, the right person. Right? Yes, I love it. So that tells me this story is far from over, Rocky. Um, no, and then my life has gotten flipped upside down, like for real. I do, and now I'm back in Philadelphia, so I feel like that, you know, the Fresh Prince. I don't even know, like, <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? But um, I do feel that we're on the right path. I hear from the audience every single day, like, I've been looking for this. I need this. Oh, my gosh, thank you so much. People literally, like, I was about to kill myself last night, and then I look on, and I find your page, and oh, my gosh, like, I have to do more work. It's incredible. Parents who come out, you know, like, out of the woodworks. Uh, the stories are amazing. I can't wait to hear more. I can't wait to learn more, mm -hmm. um, you know, and engage with people, and engage with people who support us. So thank you. No, I think that's wonderful. And I would love to have you back once this thing gets I ready mean, yeah, to go out. I mean, yeah, I would love to be back. Yes, I yes. Yeah, I would totally love to be back anytime. You know what? And if, if the if the listeners say they want they want to know more, we can get into. I mean, we can get into any of the translation stuff if you want. We can have a specific. Uh, you know, if we want to talk about the definitions of Malakoi and Arsenikoitai, you know, if you want to talk about some of the history of the translation, like what the words were before mm -hmm. it was homosexual, all of that stuff is super fascinating. That sounds awesome. I'd love to do that sometime with you, Rocky. Thanks so much for being a part of this show. And I can't wait to be able to see this film. Thank you so much for having me, Stuart. Much thanks to Rocky. And we'll have all of those links that we talked about in our show notes. You can be able to check those out to be able to either find out more information about the film or hop in and help them finish the film with their Kickstarter campaign. And having conversations like this is just a stark reminder about the amount of damage and pain that our faith has caused groups of people. And, and I say this not to just collectively making us feel bad. I, I say this because if we can acknowledge where we have fallen short in the past, we can lean in and look towards how we can fix that and move in a more loving way into the future. Now, I talked earlier in the show about, um, about Semler's new worship album. A worship album by an LGBTQ artist that was number one on Christian iTunes. And she says this, and I feel like this is kind of a fitting end, and this is in her song, Bethlehem. And it goes like this. The first song I learned spoke of Bethlehem. So is that prophecy or is that brainwashing? Because no one ever pitched the Greek gods, and I don't know why not. I think Athena would understand me. When my chips have fallen, my Messiah came calling. But what if he'd not? Would my soul just rot? Oh, what I'd give for just an inch of your peace. Because I want to fall, but I've got bruises on my knees. And she later in the song says this, But I'm a child of God, in case you forgot. And you cast me out every single chance you got. That's your loss, not mine. I'll be better than fine. You've just missed your shot at meeting the unholy divine. When we dismiss people, we miss the ability to be able to see God's creation and them. Or that they are God's creation. Probably the, the better way to say it. When we dismiss people, we forget that they are created in the image of God. Christians spend so much time speaking about God, 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 God. Well, God, 
you should really just love more. I think that's the way we need to do to be able to move forward. A future Christianity driven by grace and compassion and love is the only way forward. Otherwise, we're stuck with a bunch of hateful, bigoted folks that I really don't want representing me or think are a good representation of Jesus. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. We need to reject the hate and move in a way towards being more and more like Christ towards others. Well, before I send you off, just a reminder to subscribe and give Snarky Faith a review over on Apple Podcasts. It helps get the word out to new listeners. If you want to reach out to me directly, hit me up at questions at snarkyfaith.com. Thank you for being a part of the show this week. And this week and every past week and every week moving forward, I just want you to know how much I appreciate all of you. And as I do every week on the show, I release you out into the wild, wide world. And I send you out with the holiest amount of grace and peace and snark. Go be Jesus to people that need Jesus. And I'm not talking about Christians, even though they need Jesus too. That's all I got this week. I'm out of here. Peace.